Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, I'm going to be covering two pediatric disorders. I'm going to be covering Hirschsprung disease, and I'm going to be covering appendicitis. Now, before we get started, I'm going to ask you to please support me, help support this channel by liking this video. Do it now so you don't forget. Like this video, subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already, and engage with me in the comments. I cannot get to everyone, but I really try my best to respond to as many people as I can. Let me know um, what you'd like me to cover in the next video or what you'd like me to cover extensive, more, ex wait, more extensively. That's not proper English. Extensively. And um, let me know what you thought about this video. Don't forget I have audio lessons available on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. All right, guys, so let's get started. We're going to start with Hirschsprung's disease. And look what it says. It said Hirschsprung disease. This is a congenital. This is your key. A, ganglionic megacolon. When you ever, you see that for medical terminology, when you see an A in front, that means to be without. So without ganglionic megacolon, and this is going to make a big difference in this disorder and you'll learn shortly. So let's take a look. Hirschsprung disease. This is a congenital anomaly, which means they're born with it. That results in a mechanical obstruction from inadequate motility of part of the intestine. Let me tell you something. And the reason that the, the bowel is obstructed. The reason that there is no motility because of the ganglion, it's missing, okay? This nerve. Let's look at the pathology, pathophysiology. All right, pathology of Hirschsprung disease relates to the absence of the gangliotic cells in the affected areas of the intestine, resulting in a loss of rectal sphincter reflex and abnormal microenvironment of the cells of the affected intestine. Guys, all of that, is to tell you that because those ganglionic cells are missing, those um th that area where the sphincter is, is not relaxing the way that it should. Okay, and you're gonna you're gonna see this in a second. The absence of ganglionic cells in the affected bowel results in a lack of enteric nervous system stimulation, which decreases the internal sphincter's ability to do what? Relax. Remember. That sphincter is tight. You have to, you know, apply pressure and it's supposed to open up. So because the patient doesn't have these gangliotic cells, that sphincter re remains tight and it doesn't relax. How is the stool supposed to get through? It doesn't. Normally, when the stool bolus enters the rectum, the internal sphincter relaxes and the stool is evacuated. That's what's supposed to happen. In uh, Hirschsprung disease, the internal sphincter does not relax. So guess what? Stool can get through. I want you guys to take a look at this. So here goes the colon. This is a, the um, sigmoid colon. Look at how distended it is. The reason it's so distended is all that fecal matter that's supposed to be going through the rectum is not. That rectum's not relaxing. You see this portion? This is the agangliotic portion. There is no relaxation of that internal sphincter. Okay. Clinical manifestation. So neonate usually seen with a distended abdomen. It's going to be distended because all that fecal matter is just backing up. Okay. A distended abdomen, feeding intolerance with bodice of vomiting and the delay in passage of meconium. Remember, they're supposed to pass that meconium the first 24 to 48 hours, 48 hours being the longest amount of time. And we're like, uh oh, what's going on? Diagnostic evaluation. The diagnosis is suspected on the basis of the clinical signs. So let's get into these clinical signs because you guys do need to know them. Failure to pass meconium within 24 to 48 hours after birth. Vomiting is full of bowel. Abdominal distension. Failure to thrive. Again, abdominal distension. Ribbon-like bowel smelling stools. Abdominal distension, early uh, palpable fecal max. Now you see these three plus uh, the failure to pass meconium uh, within 24 to 48 hours after birth. That has been seen as a select all that applies on NCLEX numerous times. So make sure you know all of these signs and symptoms because I don't write that test, right? Make sure you know all of them, but I'm just letting you know, especially know this one and these. When you see that, you need to be thinking of Hirschsprung disease.
On examination, the rectum is empty of feces, the, the internal sphincter is tight, and leakage of liquid stool and accumulated gas may occur if the aganglionic seg um, segment is short. To confirm the diagnosis, they're going to do a, a rectal biopsy, and then um, when they look at that portion of the rectum under a microscope, they will see that those ganglionic cells are missing. They're not there. That's what's causing that area to not relax for the fecal matter to get through. Therapeutic, by the way, something else I want to bring to your attention. So it makes sense to you guys why the little stool that does get through, it's going to be ribbon-like. Why? Th take a look at this. Look how tiny and skinny this area is. Only a little bit of fecal matter will get through. That's why it's going to be ribbon-like. Ribbon it makes sense. All right, let's look at therapeutic management. The majority of children with um, Hirschsprung disease do require surgery. Once the child is stabilized with fluid and electrolyte replacement and colonic cleansing with enemas if needed. Nursing care management. Again, treatment with enemas. And look at this. Look at the kind of diet, guys. Low fiber, high calorie, high protein diet. Uh, they don't need more fiber, guys, because the problem isn't the stool. The stool's there. It just can't get through because of the obstruction, because of uh, there's no gangliotic cells. So it makes sense to have a low fiber diet, but high calorie, high protein, calorie to help fight this, a uh, protein, protein's good what? For fighting as well. So, and we need the baby to, the, not baby, the infant to grow. So they need those calories for growth. They need that protein for growth. Protein is also good for muscle building, but in this particular case, that's not what it's for. All right. Emergent preoperative care includes frequent monitoring of vital signs and uh, blood pressure. We're going to check them for signs of shock. We want to make sure they're not bleeding out. We're going to check them, make sure we're replacing fluid and electrolytes as needed. Plasma or other blood derivatives, if that patient is bleeding out and needs to be replaced. Observe for signs and symptoms of <gasps> bowel perforation. Guys, whenever you see perforation, that is a medical emergency. So you better be looking for those signs and symptoms of bowel perforation. What are those signs and symptoms? Fever, increasing abdominal distension, vomiting increased tenderness, irritability, dyspnea, and cyanosis. Because progressive distension of the abdomen is a serious sign, guys, that lets us know that this is getting worse, not better. The nurse measures the abdominal circumference with a paper tape measure. You're going to place it at the umbilicus or the widest part of the abdomen. The point of measurement is marked with a pen to make sure that um, the rest of the measurements that come afterwards are, are reliable. So make sure you know where you're going to put that measuring tape at the umbilicus or the widest part of their tummy, and you're going to mark it in pen. Postoperative care is the same for any child or infant that has had abdominal surgery. And guys, that's your Hirschsprung disease. Not as hard as you thought it was, right? Right. All right, let's move on to appendicitis. You know what? Before I move on to appendicitis, I did see, I saw um, in the comments, uh, several of you asked which book I was using, and I replied to one person, but not everyone, because I saw several of those questions. So this is the book, Maternal Child Nursing Care. This is a wonderful book. If you want, want to understand PEDS or OB, I encourage you to get it, seventh edition. This is the book I'm teaching out of for this video. All right, appendicitis. So appendicitis, this is an inflammation of the appendix. It's the most common cause of emergency abdominal surgery in children. Classically, the first symptom of appendicitis is periumbilical pain that's followed by, you guys need to know this, nausea, right lower quadrant pain. You have to know the area, guys. Right lower quadrant pain. And then later they may have fever and vomiting. Those are classic symptoms of appendicitis. Again, appendicitis is a medical emergency because God forbid that thing ruptures. All right. Oh, here goes what I just said to you. Perforation. 
perforation, it rupturing, perforation of the appendix can occur in approximately 40 out, 48 hours of the um, initial complaint. That's a medical emergency. You only have so much time to get that patient to OR or they're going to die. It's not if they die, it's when, okay? Complications from appendiceal perforation, that's when that appendix ruptures. The complications include major abscess. I want you to think about this, guys. Perforation of the appendix. You now have fecal matter in what is supposed to be a sterile environment. That patient's going to become septic. So yes, complications include a major abscess, phlegmon, enterocutaneous fistula, peritonitis, and partial bowel obstruction. For testing purposes, when it comes to complications, this is the one they ask about the most. So make sure you know it, peritonitis. Etiology, the cause of appendicitis is obstruction of the lumen of the appendix, and it's usually um, by hardened fecal mat um, material. So it's fecal matter stool that got stuck in that tiny little area. Let me see if the book has a picture. It doesn't. The older edition did. But anyway, um, in the appendix, this tiny little area, the fecal matter gets stuck in there and it just sits there. So what happens is bacteria starts to grow, right? And then it becomes inflamed. That fecal matter, it sits there, bacteria, bacteria starts to grow, it becomes inflamed. And it's just sitting there, it gets hard. Clinical manifestations. The first symptom, whenever you see your reading and you see first, second, third, or priority, pay attention. The first symptom of appendicitis is usually colicky, cramping, abdominal pain located around what? The umbilicus, the umbilicus, that pain. Referred pain is a term used for vague peri-umbilical localization. So that referred pain is pain the patient feel, feels that's different from the site of origin. That's what they're talking about. The most important physical finding is focal abdominal tenderness. Look at these clinical manifestations. Again, you have to know this location, right lower quadrant abdominal pain. You better be thinking of appendicitis. Fever. Again, think about that fecal matter just sitting there, then bacteria growing. Yeah, they're going to have signs and symptoms of infection. A rigid abdomen. Decrease or absent bowel sounds, vomiting, um, stoop posture. This is important to know. When they say stoop posture, that patient's going to be guarding. They're going to be like this. They're going to be guarding that area. They're not going to want you coming near them. They're going to stay in one spot. Okay? It's not like a patient that has um, gallstones where it's so painful, they do, I call it the gallstone dance because they're moving all over the place trying to find a comfortable position. That's not the type of party that we're talking about here. This patient's going to stay in one, one spot and they're going to try to guard that area so you don't touch it. All right, some other clinical manifestations. You have to be aware of these terms. And guys, read it on your own. I'm not going to go over all of them, but you do need to know these terms. And by the way, if you decide to go on and um, do your NP, this these same um, clinical manifestations, they not only do they show up for um, uh, RN, they show up for PN as well. So make sure you know them. The McBurney's point, the Rosvick sign. Now this is tenderness in the right lower quadrant. Remember that's where that pain is. That occurs during palpation or percussion of other abdominal quadrant. Excuse me. Patient will have a rebound tenderness where you palpate the area. And then when you let go, they have that pain that's called rebound tenderness. The child may not be able to walk well and may complain of pain in the right hip caused by the inflammation of the psoas or ellipsis, iliopsoas muscles. Again, low-grade fever can occur, but absence of fever does not exclude appendicitis. So just because they don't have a fever, that doesn't mean that's not appendicitis. Nursing alert. Signs of peritonitis. What are signs to let you know that the appendix has ruptured? And we now have fecal matter in what should have been a sterile environment. What is a sign to let us know that this is a medical emergency? If we don't get that patient into the operating room, they will die. What are those signs and symptoms? Rigid guarding of the abdomen, 
progressive. That word progressive, guys, it means as time goes on, it only gets worse. Progressive abdominal distension, tachycardia, rapid shallow breathing, pallor, chills, irritability, and restlessness. Make sure you know it. Don't say I didn't warn you. Diagnostic evaluation. We're going to be checking the CBC, especially the hemat H and H, the hematocrit and um, what's the other H for? Hematocrit and hemoglobin, right? We want to make sure they're not losing blood. We're going to do a urinalysis to rule out UTI because if they have a fever, you know, it might be a UTI. So we're going to, especially guys, think about it. Fever with abdominal pain. It very well could be a UTI. So you're going to go ahead and do a urinalysis as ordered. Look at the CRP. Remember when CRP is elevated or ESR is elevated, what, what does that tell you is present? Inflammation. So we're going to be looking at the CRP. We're going to do look at the ultrasound or CT and look at what it says. Ultrasound is considered positive in the presence of enlarged uh, appendiceal diameter. Why do you think that that um, appendix the diameter of the appendix would be enlarged because of all that fecal matter that's inflamed in there. That's why. Therapeutic management. The treatment for appendix, the treatment for appendicitis, look, before, before perforation is surgical removal of the appendix. And that's the appendectomy. We don't want to wait until the patients had a um, perforation to try to save their lives, right? The, the treatment for appendicitis before perforation is removing that appendix. We're going to give them antibiotics preoperatively. We're going to give them fluids and electrolytes. The um, appendectomy can be done, usually will be done by laparoscopic procedure. Now let's talk about the ruptured appendix. Now we have perforation. We didn't want it to happen, but it happened. What are we going to do? Preoperatively, you're going to give the patient fluids and electrolytes. You're going to give them antibiotics. NG suction. We have to decompress that um, um, the stomach, guys. So you're going to be give, doing NG su suction. Postoperative management. After the patient came from surgery, they're going to get IV fluids. We're going to continue giving them antibiotics. We're going to continue to suction them because they're going to be NPO. We don't want them getting peptic ulcers. We don't want to deal with a whole other list of complications. Look at this nursing alert. In any instance in which severe, I remember what I taught you about this word, guys, by now, when you guys see that word severe, bell should be going off in your head. In an instance in which severe abdominal pain is observed, the nurse must be aware of the danger of administering laxatives or enemas. Why? Those measures can stimulate bowel motility and increase that risk of that patient's appendix rupturing, causing a perforation. Nursing care management. Younger nonverbal children, so they can't talk to you, they can't tell you what's wrong. Younger nonverbal children will assume a rigid sideline position. You have to know this position, guys. Look, with the knees flexed. And they're going to have decreased range of motion on that right hip. Why? Remember the right hip, that's the area where they have the pain. Palpating the abdomen should be delayed until all other assessments have been made because God forbid it is appendicitis and here you go palpating that inflamed area that's at risk for perforation. Postoperatively, the child, again, maintain our IV fluids, antibiotics, NPO. We are going to decompress that tummy, that stomach. They are going to have NG suction. The child also remains on low intermittent gastric decompression until there's evidence of a return of intestinal motility. So you're gonna be listening to the bowel sounds in all four quadrants, and you wanna hear um, signs of bowel activity, such as a passage of stool. All of these are part of the routine assessment. Did they have a BM? Are they passing gas, flatus? Pain management is an essential part of the child's care. Now I've taught this a lot for the adults, but guys, it's the same for peds. Pain never killed anyone. When it comes to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? Pain is pretty up there. Down here, the most important thing is fluid electrolytes, nutrition, glucose, rest, vital signs, hemodynamic status, all that stuff that keeps the patient alive, right? Pain never killed anyone, except in 
certain situations, such as what? Um, and when I say killed anyone, I mean that pain is so much, it can physiologically cause um, damage or put the patient's life at risk, right? And so what is that? Am I um, sickle cell, gallbladder, appendicitis slash uh, perforation, right? There are certain type of disorders. That pain is so strong, you have to treat it the same as you would physiological integrity, okay? So when it comes to appendix, appendicitis and perforation, um, pain management is essential. For the older kids, you know, they can get a PCA for that short amount of time. But for the younger uh, um, kids, not so much, but you got to make sure you keep that pain under control. Analgesics are given, given regularly to control pain. And that's your appendicitis, guys. So we went over um, her sprungs. We went over appendicitis. Easy peasy lemon squeezy. Not as hard as you thought it was. Please, in the comment section, help me. Help the algorithm. Help this video show up on, on more nursing students' pages by liking this video, subscribing to the channel. Share this video on your social media platform or with a friend, a coworker, a colleague, a nursing instructor. Let them know about me, guys. I'm almost at 100,000. So, guys, I'm asking you to please help push my videos. I'm almost at 100,000 um, subscribers. I'm very excited about that. Don't forget, I have audio lessons available on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. And almost daily, you guys can find me um, going over a different nursing material on my other social media platforms, such as TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. Thank you so much for watching this video, and you got to catch me on the next video.